Hello everybody, welcome to Therapy Dog Talk. My name is Sherry and my dog Sunny is training to be a therapy dog and each week we talk to a different therapy dog team, whether they're past, present, or future. And sometimes we even have some test observers in here too, which is really great and just get you know some different ideas of what it's like to be a therapy dog or to work towards being a therapy dog. Hi! Hello! <laughs> It's been so long since we were on the live together. Oh no, I know, exactly. I'm so happy to join. Daryl is here. He's just, he's working on a Kong. He'll make appearances, don't you worry. This is his time of day where he is just like, I don't want to say needy, but he likes to be recognized and present. <laughs> um, well, Haley, for those who don't know you, would you like to introduce yourself and your pup? Yeah. Hi, I am Haley Adair. Oh my gosh. And this is Daryl. He is in belly rub mode. So. I currently am working for a nonprofit where Daryl comes to work with me when we go into the office. So he's also an office dog and a certified trick dog with the intention, which actually started a couple years ago, but we kind of put it on pause to someday become a therapy dog. That's great. I know we've talked a lot about each other's training journeys along the way and how they haven't necessarily been linear or perfect, but just kind of taking the time to go at our dog's pace. So that's been something that we've really connected over. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. We took kind of a roundabout approach, I guess, slightly different from yours. We initially started, oh, here he is again. He's just too funny. He's more entertaining than I am. We started our journey probably about the same time you did in obedience classes. And we absolutely loved training. We found that training was a lot of fun. He was just not interested in the obedience classes as much. My intention was to start him yeah. doing agility and doing more of like the obedience things in order to become certified to be a therapy dog because in yeah. the line of work that I'm in, therapy dogs are very common and he has been mm -hmm. mistaken for a therapy dog a lot and just coming into our office. So I have to correct people yeah. all the time. Yeah. He does offer therapy, but he's not a therapy dog. <laughs> So anyways, yeah, we started in obedience classes and came to find out that he needs a little bit more time, needs to mature a little bit. And the type of training that we do, I really just try to listen to him and see kind of what he wants to do and take it at his own pace, like you mentioned earlier. And we found that his love and passion was really for like the tricks. So we kind of went yeah. that route. But we're starting to kind of see him now that he's three years old, he's starting to listen a little bit more and be more interested <laughs> in actually doing some of the basics now. So we're hopeful that yeah. this is our first. Well, you know, by listening to him and focusing on the tricks and the things that he likes to do, you're teaching him that listening to you is fun. So that actually is really helpful for obedience because he's learning, oh, if mom's talking and dad's talking, like something fun is going to happen. So Exactly. No, you totally nailed it. We work on communication type training every day. Our training styles are, I'm kind of all over the map, honestly. I've gotten to the point where I am a very good trainer. To Daryl. But if I were to have to train another dog, it would be just who knows how it would go. But we do a lot of like listening and kind of just letting him free shape things to try to figure out how to do things on his own. So I encourage a lot of just like free shaping behavior and we do positive reinforcement training. So he gets a lot of treats, yeah. but just really trying to make every single piece of our day intentional. So that might mean like our walk that we just took right after work was to kind of decompress, but also having him focus on me the whole time, like try to yeah. ignore everything else and really just tune into what I'm saying and what I'm asking and really trying to have that focus time, um, no matter what we're doing. I think that's really helped us kind of step back into that direction of hopefully going back to obedience classes again. So Haley, yeah. how did you first find out about therapy dogs? What put that on your radar? So I, like I said, in the work that I do, there's a lot of therapy dogs in my field of work. So in like retirement communities, and I used to work in memory care. So I got to see like different therapy animals come in. And I always thought it was a really, really cool thing because I, of course, have a love for animals and really find myself gravitating towards that type of therapy. I mean, Daryl's my emotional support animal. So I personally think it's so important to be able to offer that type of therapy 
to people to give people a variety of different options. And I work with yeah. people with dementia. So animal therapy is a really like great resource for people living with dementia and caregivers. So I was passionate about it from just my field of work. And seeing him in my office and seeing how it just calms people down, like him being there and having caregivers come in or guests come in and being like, you know, being able to have their dog time. And I mean, people come in and just start crying when he would go over to them because it was just like, you know, that release of emotion. And so I, and all times at my office, are you planning on getting him certified to be a therapy dog? Like he'd be great at it. And so many people commented how just his demeanor is a perfect fit. His obedience, some work. <laughs> but his personality and his demeanor most of the day is just a perfect fit for this type of work. And then I started kind of looking around and hearing more about it. I heard about Carmel. I heard about Magnus. And I know Juno is on here. And there's other dogs on Instagram that I started seeing that were going through this whole process. And I mean, just watching your journey, it is a process. It's a long journey and it's not linear. There's a lot of aspects and a lot of things to it. So I was a little bit intimidated by doing that at the beginning of the pandemic because there was a lot going on. So I decided to kind of put it on pause and do the fun route, do the tricks, do the whatever he wanted to do. But the whole time in the back of my mind, I know that I want to get him certified and I know that he would be so great at it. And he's still young. So I know that as he gets older, it'll be easier for him to be a little more mellow and hopefully interested in more cuddly and more (laughs) intimate work rather than wanting to run around all the time. Yeah. And, you know, I think we most often hear the stories about like the perfect dog that qualified to be a therapy dog, like the day that they were old enough or whatever. But I don't think that that's the norm. I think that's just what we hear about the most. And there's nothing wrong with just letting him go at his own pace and approaching it when the timing feels right. And it sounds like he's getting a lot of really great practice now anyway. Yeah, it's so fascinating. I mean, all the stories that I've heard about for becoming certified to be a therapy dog have all been, maybe there's some like agility, maybe there's some trick stuff on the side, but it's the intention is very set to take the steps in order to become a therapy dog. But I think a lot of the work that we do is very fundamental. And it's a lot of the like laying foundation for learning how to be that team and to communicate and learn each other's communication styles. I feel extremely tuned into him at this point, And I did not when we started training. Mm-hmm. So I think at this point, I think just being able to use all the things that we've learned through a variety of different training styles has been really great. We do intentionally try to practice some of the skills that we need for like obedience three and to actually pass the canine good citizen. So we're working on a lot of those things just individually. And it's hard. I mean, I go outside on walks and all I want to do is let him say hi to people. So I have to kind of pull myself back. And I know Sunny and Daryl have very different challenges. And so it's interesting to hear like from your standpoint, like what your focuses are Mm -hmm. and kind of like with us, ours is kind of the opposite. Like we have to really, really focus on pulling him back from saying hi and being like that really social butterfly because his whole life he's been encouraged to like, you know, walk into the room and be like, hi, I'm here. Let's meet everybody. And so now having to pull him back and teach him to listen to me and wait for the cues to be able to like do that type of thing. Yeah, I think, you know, they have a very big size difference. I think (laughs) we haven't met in person yet soon, April. So prepare for your feeds to be spammed then. But Sunny, she loves to meet people. Actually, she loves to make friends and she'll prance right up to them. And sometimes when we're walking, she'll like nudge someone in the back of the calf. Mm -hmm. But what concerns her that we're working on is when they bend over her to pat her on the top of her head, which dogs don't like. (laughs) But she's so small that it's like even scarier. So that's why we been really focused on confidence and optimism because it isn't that she doesn't want to say hi it's that their approach because most people don't know how to greet dogs is just really intimidating for a small dog yeah it, that is hard and that's a whole other topic for a whole nother day <laughs> the whole educating of the general population on how to greet dogs and how to work with different types of working dogs but yeah so it is it's interesting and there's so many different like components and i think i mean quite honestly At the beginning of the pandemic, his obedience was not great. But now that we're at this point, we've worked a lot on his obedience. But there are certain things like just his separation anxiety and things like he's become more reactive to certain things. So we're having to work through the things. He didn't have as many reactive issues at the beginning of the pandemic. And now there are certain things that he's just like overstimulated when we walk outside. And so things like his trigger is 
crosswalk signs and we live by train tracks. And so his other thing is the gates that like go up and down and beep really loud. And his thing is like, he overreacts to them. So he's not scared of those things. He wants to like either attack them or like go say hi to them. I'm not sure, but either one is extremely unsafe. So we've had to work a lot on just that sort of thing and trying to desensitize him and work on his reactivity because I mean, my concern is he gets overly anxious and overly excited about these types of things. And I want him to be okay in a variety of different environments. I mean, you never know what types of work or what the environment's going to be when you walk into a hospital or we would probably go into like the assisted living route. I think I know we've talked about this before, like the different types of work that we want to do and what works for our pups and us. And I think my concern is like going into an assisted living or like a memory care and there might be loud noises here and there. You might not be able to control the environment around him. And so I think just figuring out ways that we can work on his reactivity and some of the loud noise behaviors is like a focus of ours right now. Yeah, that makes sense. That's really important, whether you're a therapy dog or not, just to be able to live a stress-free Absolutely. life. So, yeah. Yeah. That's what I love about the therapy dog training, you know? Like, people always say, like, don't, like, stress too hard about your dog becoming a therapy dog if they don't want to be. But the thing is, if you work towards that training, it's just going to help them enjoy life better anyway. So oh, even if you don't end up becoming a therapy dog team, you're not wasting time or effort. <laughs> no, not at all. And, I mean, there's things that we've been working on just to – well, we have to pass obedience two first, but to pass obedience three, um, there are things <laughs> like brushing, like as simple as brushing or ignoring a dog when you're walking by. Shoot, I was coming home just 15, 20 minutes ago and I walked by another dog that I know is reactive and I had to get Daryl's focus completely so he wouldn't set off the other dog. And so it's just simple things yeah. like that that I use in my everyday life that are parts of the obedience three training so it's really interesting just going through some of these things and you're right you use it in daily life yeah and the nice thing about obedience three is that class is literally just the cgc test every single class period you go through the whole thing so they get so much practice which is really yeah Yeah. i'm so excited we're ready to go back we've just been putting it off because i hate to tell you how many times we've failed obedience too um like i know we've had this conversation we were in the same boat for a long time this we try number eight maybe nine yeah, we did a lot, but you know, it's okay. It's fine. I just own that we're perfectly imperfect. Absolutely. When he wants to do it, he will. And unfortunately, he sees the place that we go as a very fun place to be. And he absolutely yes. loves the trainers there and decides that he wants to listen to them more than he wants to listen to me. So it's just kind of getting back into the routine and figuring out the right combination to have him tired so that he's focusing but not tired that he's not listening which has been kind of a struggle for us it's a difficult sweet spot to find it really is yeah what do you think daryl will enjoy about being a therapy dog so he loves meeting people like absolutely loves meeting people he loves other dogs loves other animals but he's a people dog for sure he likes being pet his first thing he does when he walks into the office after digging through the garbage and getting treats is going onto his back and like putting his legs up like you just talked a little bit ago and just like waiting for belly rubs he just wants to be pet all the time and I've tested his boundaries like quite a bit in terms of what he can handle with pets and he has dealt with like kids pulling his ears and like putting their hands in his mouth and he has never shown any sort of like pulling his tail and he doesn't I mean of course I'm very careful about it I monitor it it's safe but he really has no limits in terms of like touch like that's his love language in addition to treats is definitely like touch he wants to be touched all the time he wants to be like on my feet or being pet he's really good at just like letting people like touch him and loves being pet loves the attention and I think just like he's great about like tunes I've tried a couple times when I've been on like the brink of feeling like I'm about to have like an anxiety attack or something like that and he's actually like really good at tuning into that sort of thing and we've practiced deep pressure therapy and we practiced other types of things like that and so he's really good about just like tuning in and kind of knowing his boundaries knowing his limits and really knowing like kind of the level meaning to the level of the person so yeah all of those reasons nice what do you look forward to about being a therapy dog team with Daryl well I also love working with people and I honestly miss the interaction of being able to just be with other people so much I love sharing my dog obviously 
And I think just being able to offer people some sort of support and just that sense of relief that people get when they have like a dog in the room, especially I've seen him work with other people, but also my family dogs. I've seen them with my grandparents who have had dementia. And it is amazing to see the work that they can do on people that are living with dementia and just people that have stress in their lives and other diseases and illnesses. But I'm really excited to be able to get into either assisted livings or hopefully maybe memory cares if they'll let us at that point in time. It's a little challenging now, but it's amazing to see the work that animals can do with people. And especially in today's world where people have been stuck inside for two years and it's horrible. People are declining just so quickly and I would love to get out there and just have him be around them and just be something that they can touch and socialize. And, you know, sometimes people are at the point where they can't necessarily communicate with humans, but animals can do magic basically with people. It's amazing to see what they can do. Kind of like, I mean, music therapy, there's all sorts of great things out there, but animals just have a way of like working with people. And honestly, they're like magic. So I'm excited to hopefully as things open back up, get back into memory cares and assisted livings and just hopefully bring a little bit of happiness to people that are experiencing extreme stress right now. I think that's really beautiful. You're not where you want to be in your journey yet, but from where you are so far, do you have any advice for someone who's interested in becoming a therapy dog team? I mean, just like we talked about earlier, take your time and listen to your dog, like follow your dog's lead, honestly. Of course, you're going to have to lead them a little bit as well. But I think just the communication part and some of the fundamentals like that are so important. I mean, we knew right away that he had the potential to be a therapy dog just from how he acted as a puppy. And I think it's important to just kind of listen and know that you don't want to force your dog into anything. Like I learned quickly, he is not an agility dog. I wanted him to be an agility dog so badly, but he's just not, he's not meant to be an agility dog. And so I think it's just important to learn from each other and communicate, work on your communication skills. And then just, we all have our own individual challenges and strengths. And I think it's important to just listen to those. And like you said, we're all perfectly imperfect and just embrace on those strengths. Don't force yourself or your dog and don't hold yourself to too high of standards. Just find your hidden talents and have fun with it, honestly. Yeah, I love that. I love that so much. Well, thank you so much, Her- Haley. Hey, Harley. <laughs> I just combined you and Daryl. Daryl. <laughs> I'm so used to just calling you Daryl in our chats. I know. I know. <laughs> yeah, I know we could talk forever about our dogs because we've done it before. But is there anything else that you want to share while you're here? Well, I did just want to say that I wore this for you, my dog mom shirt. Oh, nice. Uh-huh. <laughs> I love it. Thanks <laughs> so much. This is such a great show. I'm so excited to continue watching all your episodes of various people around the world that are going through very different but similar paths and thanks again for having us yeah of course and if anyone wants to follow your journeys and see all of daryl's great tricks and office shenanigans they can find you at daryl the doge right yep daryl the doge all right well thank you have a great day bye you too bye everyone